go ahead. All right. These were the homework assignments and um, hopefully everybody is seeing, you're not seeing my screen anymore, are you? Because I am. Okay. Yeah, I see your screen says grass is homework. That's all you see. You don't see my other stuff. Okay, good. Um, well, I see the pictures on the side. Okay. Of the people. No, no it's not. It's not working. We click see your resume other slide. stuff. Yep. Now click on the screen. There you go. Okay. All right. <sighs> We're going to look at the year of corn first, and this is especially for Clara, since she was not able to find one. But I hope that you have. I hope you have undressed an ear of corn at some time in your life. Yes. yes. Okay. And good. maybe I'll go to Safeway after this. Day. <laughs> good, good thing. Actually, undressing an ear of corn is one of the things I most dislike doing because I can never get them all. All of these yeah. these silky things. But your your task was to take this apart and try to find out where these these thread like things that we call silks where they attached in the corn, in the ear of corn. Now, some of you did this. So what did you find out? Where does that a silk attach inside the corn? Does, it, does anyone else want to go? No, Val, go ahead and talk. We're such a little group, just everybody. So this, this picture isn't a good example, but I was able to find pictures on, inter, on the internet um <laughs> that showed on, on there there should be a little dimple like right here on the kernel and that's where the silk attaches and all that made me think of um bridget's presentation of the sunflower all of these are fruit mm -hmm. all of all of those Separate kernels fruit are and, fruit. and the and the silk gets pollinated and then grows the corn, which is attached to the, the husk, like the back of a sunflower. So that's what I got out of it. Okay, anybody else want to speak up and see, did you see something? How clever of you to go to the web, <laughs> go on the <laughs> wide web and look it up. Actually, I can only see one place on this picture where you maybe can imagine what Valerie has just said. The and that is for, uh, for the, a silk to be attached to one of the kernels. Every silk that you see on an ear of corn was at least attached to a kernel. The interesting thing when you take them apart is, and you may have never noticed this, it's pretty easy to get the silks off the bottom of the ear of corn in fact, when you pull the strips off, some of them are already detached. Those were the first to develop. But the silk is, is the style of an ovary, uh, of a, a pistol, I'm sorry. It's mm -hmm. just that long neck on a pistol. The pollen from the tassels, the male inflorescence, lands on that stigma, travels down this really long silk really long silk until it gets down into the ear of corn and finds an ovary where it fertilizes it. And that ovary develops and becomes a kernel of corn. Yeah, now I did get a, I did get a cob and there was a silk attached. So I did see it in real life. Good, good. This head yeah. does not show uh, the dimple that mine did where the, where the silk attached. Yeah, in fact, some of these that on this picture that are not showing a silk attached, which is most of them, it's because it was torn away when they opened up this ear of corn. But even if you are extremely careful, you will not see the silk attached to all of them because the ovary swells as it's developing, just like the ovary in an apple does just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that swelling sometimes will break off the silk, which is the, actually the, the, the uh, style of the ovary. Fascinating little flower, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It really is. OK. So, so Jude, I have a question yeah. for you. Yeah. So is there, um, if, if I were to grow a corn at home, is there a stage where I could 
look at it and give me a better view than yes. the, the mat mature corn? Yes. Yeah. Younger. <laughs> Younger. Yes. Um, okay. So, you know, like if you felt uh, the uh, bottom third of the corn ear being kind of plump, there would still be a lot of ovaries that haven't, haven't uh, developed yet haven't enlarged, uh, maybe not even fertilized, because those silks can carry pollen for quite a few days, okay? But that's an enormously long style on a stigma, and so many of them in one, one place. Okay, well, I hope, I hope you found that interesting. The main thing, I think, to take away from this is pay attention. Really look at things and you can learn such, such a lot. I will never look at corn the same way again, ever, <laughs> <Yeah>. seriously. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad, Clara. All right, now the next task might have been a little more difficult because you didn't have to pass on that one at all. But I wonder if you could try to key that common grass, and I'm gonna show you the picture that I gave you at least I think that's the picture I gave you. It's certainly the same plant. Anybody managed to find a name for it? Hold up your hand so we can all see you. I think so. Oh, good. Oh, good. All right. Um, Val, what did you? What what name did you find for this plant? Well, I was still was a little dismayed that I didn't find any in bloom, but I came up with the pan uh, ca. Uh huh. Uh, tribe and mm -hmm. then over to crabgrass or it's digit it's um it's digitaria is the digitaria genus. okay um well, let's check with with clara and see yeah. what clara found you're muted clara so, no. oh yes so i found that it went into the quack grass. So I went to page 362. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's the couch grass, but it didn't quite go with that because the, um, this, this uh, what do you call it? The inflorescence was not straight up according to this. Well, kind of, I guess the one, one in yeah. the like uh, one o'clock, around one o'clock one. Um, yeah. that. This is kind of difficult. One, the pictures in Pojar for the grasses are not great, which is why he's got all those little drawings beside them, which are really helpful. But I'm going to tell you that neither of you have found the true name for this grass. Now, I bet John yeah. knows its common name. Do you, John? Uh, oh, I know, but it looks like crabgrass, but. No, it's not crabgrass. It's not crabgrass? How it's not about, orchard grass, I know that. It's not orchard grass. So, do you have any I, idea what it is? We fight this in the in the garden all the time in the gravel. Oh. As a matter of fact, Rick used to bring out a little uh, bazooka kind of thing, a faint flamethrower, <laughs> go through the gravel and just burn it all. That just until, makes it grow faster. <laughs> got the seeds <laughs> plumped. No, nobody's right. So do you want to go through the key together? Yes, because oh, Lori, I, Lori's got her, wait a minute, Lori's got her hand up. What, Lori? I ended up with something different, and I, I can't say I was totally confident, but I ended up with the annual bluegrass. Annual bluegrass is absolutely correct. Yay! Oh, yay. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, walk us through right. because I found this key particularly difficult. Okay. Let's let's look at it really carefully. Do all of you have your pojar with you? Yeah. Yes. Well, first let's look look on the screen. Are you seeing a closer up of the inflorescence on this plant? Yeah. Okay. Um, the words are really really off-putting because they're words that you don't have in, in anywhere else in, in your vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Whereas with studying a dicot plant, for the most part, you already knew what a petal was when you were in third grade and drawing tulips, right? Yeah. Teachers say, draw those petals really big. But here, palea and lima and glooms and stuff just really put you off. 
But if you can get a nice close up of the flower, like this one is, or maybe even better, even closer with a magnifying glass, mm -hmm. it makes it much easier. Now, what you can tell right here from this picture without knowing any of those words, how many flowers do you think are in this picture? One, three, more than three. More than three. More than three is right. This is an inflorescence. So only parts of this picture are actual little florets, which they're called here. But notice that each of these is on um, a little stalk. And that's a real clue to be used in the key. Now I'm gonna go, I've got the, the key here. Can you see that well enough? Yeah. Okay. If you just start out, you know, you've always got two choices. This one says, is an inflorescence is a spike. Well, spike straight up like a spike. It's not a spike, right? Nope. So we go to the other choice, number one. It says it's a panicle or a raceme. Oh, racemes are spikelets with stalks. Ew. Go to two. Two, we have a choice of one flower floret in each spikelet. What do you think? Mm -mm. It's more, more. There's one, one, two, th two or more, three. Okay, so we're gonna go to each spike with two too many flowers or florets. Takes us to three. Did everybody get this far? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Then in three, each. Oh, this one's tough. Each spikelet with one fertile floret above and one. Th below the fertile one, good Lord. Spikelets falling off of the glooms attached. Well, we don't see them falling off, do we? Nope. No. All right, let's go to 3B then. I don't know what all that meant this <laughs> year. 3B though says, it has two too many flowers. Okay, florets. Sterile florets, if presents are above the fertile ones, I can't tell. See, I got lost in all that. Okay, all so. right. Now, two spikelets usually falling off. We're kind of at a loss here, aren't we? Yeah. We don't have enough knowledge to answer these questions. So what you can do at that point is to say, okay, I'm going to try one of these choices and see how far that takes you. Now, which choice you take is up to you, but is there anything in there that would make you want to go to 3B rather than 3A? I, I like that 3B myself. I like it too. Why, John, do you like it? Because it has more than one uh, flower for it. For That's that. right. Just that alone, that it has two too many flowers, and our little thing does have two too many. Mm -hmm. So let's go with 3B, knowing that we may have made the wrong choice, but no, we're not, not sure. <laughs> Okay, Not and that tells us to go to four. So then in four, gloom shorter. Now here you know have to know what a gloom is. The gloom is that lowest thing on mm -hmm. the inflorescence. You could think of it like a brack, a mm -hmm. brack on a dicot flower. Yeah. Okay, a gloom brack, gloom brack, brack gloom. Okay, it says it's shorter than the first floret. Mm -hmm. Lima all, all on, onless, and that's a really long spike that comes out from the end. Well, that fits so far, right? And then it talks about sterile florets. Peasant, no. 5A just doesn't work. Do you, can you pick out why it doesn't work? Lagoon, the lemma's on. Did you go back Barrel. and look at what an on is? It's like a needle. Yes. It's a long pointy thing on the end of a structure. And we don't so, have those. Yeah, so, okay, so that one doesn't fit that. I don't see any long, long pointy things coming out of the ends. So let's go to 5B, the glooms are broad. Yeah, well, shape. they're pretty broad. That's a fairly broad gloom. Mm -hmm. Boat shaped. Boat shaped. Yes, boat shaped. Yeah. Um, Canary grass tribe. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, uh. 
And it's not either of those, is it? Well, where have we gone wrong? This is where you have to really say, I want to know what this darn thing is and are willing to go back and look at the choices that you made previously and see where you might have gone wrong. Well, if, yeah. if, if you did, but this doesn't seem right somehow. On, on, this doesn't fit, does it? Sweet. Okay, let's go back to four. Let's just go back one step. We had four B glooms equal to or longer than the first floret. Is it equal to or, or longer than? Yes, okay. No, it's not really. Gloom shorter than first floret. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the, where the mistake was made, right the there. Four, the 4A picture is perfect to, yes. our, to our live picture, right? <laughs> it no? is. It is. It's okay. almost like they made it from it. Right yeah. Um, so then what? Okay, so where do we go? Yeah. We go to this family, the fescue family, and it is on, I'm sorry, I've already got there. Fescue family. Um, oh hey. man, we don't have two choices anymore. This is a different kind of key. Can you make, make that transition really quickly though? See, there are four yeah. lines coming off of this. Limas with ons. If narrow, the spikelet's not densely crowded. I don't know, what's at the bottom? Huh. Down there. Lemmas without ons, is that better? We yeah. have lemmas with ons, lemmas yeah. without ons. Remember on, on, ons are that long needle-like thing. Okay, let's go this way. We've got two choices. This looks more like a family tree, doesn't it? Well, the first choice here is plants of saline habitats. What do you think? Are you? Well, you know, I, I wouldn't know because I don't know what kind of habitat that thing's growing in. Well, um, I did say that you can go outside your house and look just about anywhere. Don't walk down the street and you're almost certainly going to see this thing in flower. Okay, right now. well then it's not that. It's it is not that. So mm -hmm. it's not saline. So we have to go down here and we got two choices down at the bottoms. Glooms not papery or glooms papery. Well, they don't look papery to me. I'm sorry I've lost the picture. Yes. Do you want me to go backwards to it? I, I would say not papery also. Not papery also. Okay. Uh, so from that, I'm going to have to split the page, go over to this side on the right. <clears throat> uh, not papery. We've got three choices here. Limas with veins converging at tip. Often cobwebby at base. Spikelets usually small, I don't know. <sighs> Limas with seven prominent parallel veins. No. I don't know, no, I don't think so. Mm -mm. Limas with mostly five prominent parallel veins, not cobwebby. Yes. Do you think, I'm gonna go back to the picture if I can find it. <clears throat> now, uh, what are we trying to cho choose between the number of prominent veins? There yeah. were five prominent veins, Hopefully seven five. prominent veins, no prominent veins, or one vein. Hmm. Do you see five prominent anythings there? No. No, I don't. I, I don't not. see. Okay, I can see kind of a vein right there, but I sure don't see five prominent or seven prominent. So. Does that mean veins on the outer portion? This would be um, like veins like you can see on a leaf. Okay. Right. Like the picture shows teeny dots down yeah. in a row. So yeah. that would be a right. vein. Yeah. Okay. okay. There are no veins. They're not, not, not prominent for sure. Yeah. Okay. So here we are. Um, where are we? We're right here. We're here at POA. And this is where Laurie managed to get to. Now, Laurie, you probably had a lot of difficulty when you walked through that. Did well, what I did, this is kind of- What was your process? process, yeah. Yeah, I got to fescue somewhat 
confident. I won't say absolutely. And then I started looking at the pictures. Because uh, I kind of got lost in all the terminology. But, um, okay. Did you start looking at the pictures of these tribes, these drawings, or did you go to the actual photographs? Well, I, I looked at them, but then I really went to the photographs. Yeah. I think, oh, I think these oh, yeah. tribal uh, descriptions here that he has make it really hard to use them to go to just go looking, hunt and seek, as you might say, whereas you can hunt and seek on, on the photographs reasonably well. And these samples are pretty small. Yes, they, they are. Um, so, get to that detail. Anyway, that's really good. You wanna go back over that again or are you happy with that? If you find out you've gotten to a dead end, go back, go backwards and see if you can make a different choice somewhere because you've made a mistake if you get with the long thing. And of course you get, know that you've got the wrong thing when you see the actual photograph. And I didn't take a picture of the Pojar photograph in here, but it's, uh, it certainly looks like this and no. this, and this is what's all over the gravel at the demonstration garden in Ilma. Mm. So it's, it's an fun. annual too, huh? It is an annual. There, there are perennial bluegrasses this is in the same group, same tribe as Kentucky bluegrass, yeah. but this one is an annual. So the next time you are in the garden and you see Rick Honrider, go up to him and say, Rick, I hear you used to burn the Poa annua. <laughs> okay. and he'll say what <laughs> i did what <laughs> see i've been playing for many things but never that <laughs> that's funny oh dear well he he will love it actually if you do, if you do that okay well what were we next next thing we were going to do was to you're going to tell all of us about what you had in um, what grasses you grow in your garden? Um, Jude? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I came back and was listening, but I didn't catch it. What was, what was the variety of grass that that keyed out to? This is annual. What is this name, everybody? <laughs> Poa. Poa annua. Oh, okay. Poa, where is the annua? I don't see that. A an annua. Oh, you go to that page, which was somewhere in your- Oh, page. three, seven, okay, now okay. I'm understanding. And there, and there you see another photograph of it and a description and common names too. So this is called annual bluegrass. Oh, okay. And Poa is the bluegrass genus and annual means annual. So I guess, I guess I stopped, I didn't consider fescue because I think of it as lawn grass. And this is not lawn grass. Well, so it is lawn I didn't grass. understand the annual and the perennial difference. Oh, here. yeah. So Lori is brilliant. I I think she she should get the prize for today. We had a prize. Somewhat lucky. I would second that. I actually I when I was keying it out, I got the um the thing that threw me was the angle of the um, the the florets, because those kind of, I don't know why, looking at the picture, I thought they pointed up a bit more. So I, I thought it was the bent grass. Oh, but, I see. Um, yeah, but, some of them do bend up and some of them do bend down. Yeah, too, but, but I, because but, I kept going back and forth and I was like, well, wait, like which, which way does this bending and um, and I thought in the picture, yeah, like this one, it, it looks like it bends up, but the small diagram picture they have, it, it goes downward. Yeah. So and, and you, yeah. And that's you what, that's what tripped me up. <laughs> uh, well, there are lots of ways of getting tripped up, but the thing is, if you are persistent and are willing to recognize that you too make mistakes, but you can go back and, and try a different route. And the more you do that, the more you will learn how to deal with all this language that's in mm -hmm. there. But remember, there was one time when you were having language when you were in training, well, Clara was in training very recently. Some of the language that was used was new to you. 
and you learn it and remember it by using it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, okay. I have well, a question. Yeah. How do you tell if it, the flower is fertile or infertile? It, sometimes you can't is the answer. And sometimes they will have no, um, that the, the stamen will not have developed or the ovary will be just rudimentary. So you take the thing apart. Dissecting a, a floret of a grass is really a delicate operation as you might uh, imagine. Mm -hmm. But you can take it apart and compare it to one that has anthers that are obviously visible or an ovary that's obviously visible. And mainly either they are retarded or reduced in size, or sometimes you really can't tell whether they're fertile or not. Just like with people, sometimes you can't tell, right? Is that a good answer or not? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, do you want to key another flower, another plant, I mean, another grass? Sure. Let's try another one. Okay. What shall we try? Does it, uh, Boy, I would have to look at my grass slides to know what I've got. That, that might. Well, it's up to you, I guess. Then. That that would be really difficult to do with that if we don't all have the same thing. I don't think I've got another flower, okay. floret that's good enough for the key. But do go out and find something. I think right now there is a reed grass that's blooming. There is something in the oat family that's blooming. Um, there is another fescue that's blooming. I just went up in the alleyway a, a week or so ago and I saw six different kinds right away. Mm -hmm. Didn't know what they all were, but I knew they were different. Mm -hmm. So, so give that, give that a try if you could. Okay. Who wants to talk about their flowers? Their grasses. Sorry. Grasses. Yeah. I, I still have difficulty getting pictures on here. So I have, I have a, a, a sedge for sure that I know is, uh, I got at the native nursery. Um, and it has just a characteristic that I've never seen it or never knew that I've seen a sedge before, but it has a really prominent, round, strong, stock and the flower is on the very top of it and it's pretty long it's pretty long stock it has thick leaves um with sharp edges so but a picture is worth a thousand words and that wasn't a thousand words so. okay and you are you are new to your property, so that's the only thing that you had a name for. I, I just I've had to put it in. Yeah, I've got names for other ones, but they're not natives. So oh, that's okay. You can have a non-native grass. I but have I, I my don't favorite want grass is a non-native. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to run out. I don't want to run outside and get the labels. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there is something that you said that intrigues me, however. Did anybody else notice anything that just sort of went ding, ding, ding? Yeah. Not description, Clara? Um, her mentioning sedge? Yes. Uh, so, and I'm going to mention this when I share my uh, uh, photos. Um, my husband loves ornamental grasses, so we have ornamental grasses everywhere. Um, I just found out in the last couple of weeks that majority of them are not grasses. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's so shocking. It's like, what? <laughs> oh, so that was the, the bell that should have gone off to everybody that a sedge isn't a grass. Did that bell go off for anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> we noticed, now, but I like now, I'm sorry, but <laughs> that's fine. I know going, nothing. <laughs> several, several of us are going to recite a little limerick for you. I hope yeah, so. And, and I remember it. Yeah. Do you? <laughs> okay. Sedges have yeah. edges, edges, and right. rushes are round. Rushes have leaves all the way to the ground. 
So those sedges have edges. Yeah. And you said you had a sedge. Yeah. Okay. And, and it's not a grass. So thank you. It's not, now, it's not I'll, a I'll grass. never forget that. <laughs> but it's, a, it's what they call grass-like. Yeah. Like, like Clara has in her yard. It's grass-like. So are rushes. And I love rushes, at least the native ones around here, I think are really beautiful. But rushes are round. But the grasses will have leaves going all down their stem. Yeah. You know, they'll have one coming out on this side and another one coming out on that. Think what a corn plant looks like. Leaf here, leaf there, leaf here, leaf there. Um, but there was something else that you said that intrigued me. And that was when you said that your sedge had round stems. Yeah. It's bold. It's a bold round stem that tapers as it goes up. Well, to the I'm wondering if you don't have a rush. Well, this I'm. I was just relying on the on the information I got at the native nursery, and right, right. I could run out and get the and get the uh, blurb that I got with it. Uh, or 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 maybe just take a picture of it or look at it here. Um, and you say it's in flower. Is it? It it had the the there's definitely a tuft on the top and it hasn't changed for a long time. Okay. All right. I'm gonna give you another clue on how you identify a sedge as opposed to a, a grass. On the inflorescent stem of a sedge, if you were to slice it like you're cutting a carrot or a tree down and look at the cross section of that cut, it's a triangle. Hmm. Because it doesn't appear on the outside to be a triangle. You can feel it. You can oh. feel it. And like you can feel a mint has how many sides does a mint have? Four. Four. On the sedge, it has three sides. It's a tri mm -hmm. triangular in cross shape. Whereas if you cut across a rush, it's a circle around. Mm -hmm. And if you cut across a grass, it's also round, but it has those leaves that go all the way to the ground. Okay. The only conclusion I can come to it with this discussion is that the nursery mislabeled it. <laughs> not unheard of. I'm totally sorry. not, because I know what I do when I go to a nursery. If I see something and I don't know what it is, I get the label and I pull the label out. I know you're not supposed to, but I almost always do and read it. And then I carefully put it back. Mm -hmm. but not everybody does that last step. Yeah. And uh, so you can often find them, find them mixed up. Yeah. But oh, I see what you're saying. Someone could have put. Sure. Could have placed it incorrect. But, yeah, but it really sounds like a rush. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, now I can research further. So yes. Yeah. I, I love all that you do to find out the answers for these things. Val, <laughs> it's really great. <laughs> it is. Well, well I'm, uh, I'm, I'm building rain gardens, and I wanted grasses in my rain gardens. And I went when I went to Woodbrook, they really didn't have any, but this that I picked out that is labeled a sedge. So that's the only, you know, that's well, all I have in there, except yeah. for some other ornamentals that aren't. Yeah. Made. Well, many, many sedges are great in, in, in uh, watery, really wet environments, but um, you just read about a grass. How many of you go see the website 10,000 Things? Yeah. Of Washington? Yeah, Helen sent it to us always. Did she send it to everybody about the same? Uh, I don't know. Grass? She sent it to everybody, but I'm on her list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can subscribe to that website. And oh. some days he sends out one, some days nothing. And other days, I think yesterday, he sent out three different ones. A really, really interesting little, um, um, little sketches. Photographs are beautiful of plants of various kinds, insects, yeah. birds. Just whatever is pleasing his fancy at the very at that time, and did he speak to the group last year, John? Do you remember? Uh, he did uh, before the pandemic, and we had to stop having meetings. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, ten thousand things of Washington. I think it's called. 
but now I'm really eager to hear what Clara has in her garden that's a grass and what's not a grass. Yeah, so um, I was actually quite shocked in the last couple of weeks. I couldn't believe we have all these veggies. But let me share my photos. Um, uh, Jude, you'll need to stop sharing in order for oh, I'm sorry to be able to share. Okay, <laughs> that, that. okay. okay go ahead, Clara. <laughs> Can you guys see that? Oh. Not yet. Not, Not yet. yet. Okay. Share a screen can at you, the bottom. Can you see that now? Nope. No. No. Okay. So did you click mm. the green button? Yes. Okay. Did a white menu pop up? Yes. Okay. And oh, there we go. Share. Oh, I see. Here. There we go. Share. Yay, there we go. Yay, okay, okay, great, great, great. So yeah. this, this actually, um, this has been oh. kind of growing like weed. Actually, I don't think we planted this or maybe we did and it's just <laughs> producing little babies. So sure. this one, I don't know. I hope I got it right. I identified as tall manna grass, but uh, it didn't quite fit the um, pojar um key so i don't know but um so so there's this and i think this may be um a, let's see maybe the babies of hang on let me see if i could share this um i'll go to a different photo hang on any of you recognize this grass already mm -mm. I recognize the grass, first of all, do you? Okay. It's got leaves going down, the, up and down the stem. So this one, let's see. Can you guys see that one? No. No, it hasn't come up yet. Hmm. Let me share. You hit the share screen and then. And... There we there. go. There it yeah. is. Yeah. So I know this grass. So these are, are these, they're related, aren't they? Oh, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But this one did not have a flower. So I couldn't quite get out to be sure. Japanese but, woodgrass. Okay. So um, I, yeah. So I couldn't, there's no flower on this one. I don't know why. This is nice and big. And uh, this is one of my um, husband's favorites. But so I couldn't pluck a flower to identify. So I don't know whether I missed it. It came out very early in the season or it's to come up later. I don't know. Um, I have some of this and, and mine are not blooming either. Yeah, my, oh, okay. I have a bunch and mine aren't blooming either. <laughs> okay. It will so bloom maybe, later in the year and then you'll have okay. really thousands of them. Um, <laughs> okay. So, so maybe you've got a pretty nice uh habit picture there of that first one you showed us in, in with the infl inflorescence yeah maybe you can press it in a book and and look at oh, it oh i this see one flowers later That'd okay be an easy comparison okay but this is one of the world's most beautiful grasses i think very popular oh okay yeah it's beautiful um the other one that i want to share is um this one <laughs> So is this a manna grass, the, the previous one? We're not saying yet. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, she so thought it might be, but boy, the color is sure like the, the forest grass one, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. A, um, a common so, landscape so, grass. I think it's a clumping blue grass. So this one, let's see, I'm going to see if I could, you could kind of see the flower right here you see that right? yes. yeah yes yeah okay um this one actually uh according to the pojar key i came up with the uh perennial rye grass uh, uh you guys don't think so the flower kind of looks like it i'm looking at it right now so uh, only the reason why i came up with that is because um it, um, it has inflorescence of spike. So it has spikelets without 
stopped. And then that led me to Barley Tribe. And then when I went to Barley Tribe, um, it, um, let's see, and then I went to Barley Tribe and it, it, it was a spikeless solitary at each node is what I had. And then that broke it down to either spikelets with flat side facing axis of spike or spike spikelets with narrow side facing axis of spike. It took me a while to kind of figure that out or what they're talking about. Uh, yeah, now I'll say this, I wanna say this for POJAR. Yeah. POJAR covers natives, but not um, all of them, just okay. the ones that are on, oh, okay. on the coastal zone. Pojar covers plants that are not native. Yeah, Especially I don't think this is native. If yeah. they're very common. Okay. So it's quite possible that your plant is not in Pojar. Okay. I, I kind of was thought about that too. Yeah. Yeah, but it but it could be um, if you if you looked at the new key that John has, the grasses of Oregon and Washington, you might be able to find it there. But okay. let's check our, our uh, collective knowledge here. John, you said something about what you think this is called. Well, the last place I worked for a living had hundreds of these uh, in the landscape and the little tag said, uh, uh, clumping bluegrass, whatever that means. So. Oh. Oh. I was gonna second John on that, at least in the, uh, I, I can't speak to the clumping bluegrass part, but I, I've seen that in a lot of landscapes. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wouldn't be surprised, <laughs> but I, I've seen it used quite frequently as a landscape plant. Yes. It does definitely clump <laughs> if it got its name from clumping. Yes. Yeah. You could uh, kind of see that right on the background. It's um, kinda, yeah, we got multiple ones. They all started from maybe yeah. two. Yeah. All right. Next time okay. you come to the demonstration garden, Clara. Yeah. Bring this picture with you. Okay. And go over to the native garden section. Okay. And see if we have one like this there. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Very good. And also bring the picture of the first one that you so showed us. Yes. This one yes. that's back here by the hose reel. Yeah. I think yeah. we have one of those in the garden also. Okay. All right, very good. Pretty sure. Okay. All right, That's I have nice. more to share actually. Oh, so please. this one, yeah. yes. So this one, it's like, it's a grass and I really, really like it. We thought it was a grass. And then, um, let's see, are you are you seeing this one? Um, let's yeah. See. There we go, right there, this one. Oh. Oh, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So lo and behold, I went and cut off one of these uh, inflorescents, right? Mm -hmm. And it's solid. It's not hollow. <laughs> That's a oh, woody. It's, yes. So it has edges. Rigid. Yes, yes. So it's a sedge. It um, is a sedge. Yeah. There's a, a let's see. In focus picture of the uh, inflorescence. Yeah, those are lovely, really, nice. really tough. Yeah, no, so yeah, we have tons of these. I was shocked. I told my husband, did you know that we have tons of sedges and we don't have grasses? <laughs> <laughs> and he says, I knew you shouldn't have taken magic. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> no, he hates it, though. And I have a yeah. couple starts from, from this sedge. <laughs> Please. So I have another one here. This is also, lo and behold, it's a sedge. That's a uh, uh, junka, isn't it? I don't know. Rush. It's a rush. Okay, this is a rush. Okay. This is a rush. Yeah. Okay. Again, go back to the limerick. It's, it's got round. And the sedges, though, it's not in the limerick. Remember, I told you the sedges. Uh, think of the edges of sedges. Think about the edges of a triangle. Okay. So oh stick. yes, and you know, yes, dude. Oh. Actually, it was triangular. When I cut them, it was solid. So I took my magnifying glass, and it was indeed triangular, which was fascinating. Yes. 
Yeah. <laughs> it it yeah. is totally. I agree. Yeah. Totally so, fascinating. Anyways, that's all I have to share. But I've been having a lot of fun looking at these. Very, very <laughs> nice. Indeed, you have a nice selection there. And now you have two things to look up in the demonstration garden too. Yeah. I wish we had more um, uh, of these in the garden. We have some rushes, but I'm having a hard time thinking of any sedge. What about you, John? Can you remember any out there? No. In the Alma Garden? Surprising because they like that wet ground. That... Uh, it is, but it's wet in the wrong time of the year, I'm afraid. Yeah, that's true. Um, so, so Jude, um, yeah. maybe I could bring a bunch of pictures or photos of these sedges we have, because I could dig them up. We have so many and bring them. Oh. Great, I want to take you up on that, but I'm trying to come up with a way of having a wet in the summer set uh, area. And because I'm growing Selaginella, which is a club moss, a beautiful little low growing club moss, but it has to have moisture. And I have a whole lot of it now that I've rooted that I want to root, root it in quotes that doesn't have true roots um, to put in a wet place. We could do it together we'll put together a little wet area. Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. And you can bring one for Val too. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> oh, good. All right. Who wants, is that, is that, or you have some more? That's it. Okay. That was good. I have some stuff to share. It's only two. Okay. Let's hear it. Okay. So um, I keep it easy on myself by only deliberately oh. growing one one rush and Ooh, one, one grass. <laughs> so th this is not how it, any of these, as you can see, this is just some random pictures I found because I didn't get a chance to take any um, in my garden. But the grass I grow deliberately <laughs> is Japanese forest grass. Um, I love it particularly for the sound it makes when the wind goes through it. Mm -hmm. um, I really like the auditory element of it. Um, and then, so this is the genus um, Hakona Choloa. I probably butchered <laughs> that quite heavily. Um, but what's really cool about Japanese forest grass is that it can depend on the variety a little bit, but um, they can tolerate quite a wide range of sun to partial shade to even full shade. But what's neat is depending on how much sun or shade exposure it gets can affect the color um, of the leaves. So you could have the same plant, like um, this one that's highlighted on the right, all gold. Like you could have it be more sunny or more shady and that the golden color will be different, different yes. shade, depending on how much uh, light it gets. So it's just something I found really fascinating about Japanese forest grass. It also does come in a wide variety. There's um, another really popular variety that has um, a variegated like stripe down the middle of it. That one's also really popular. Um, the other thing that's really appealing be besides the auditory part and the, um, the lovely mounding habit it has, I guess for lack of a better way to describe it, um, it's very slow growing, which is which is great if you're uh, worried about spread, which is true for some, some grasses. That may be something you are concerned about. Um, the one thing though, is if you do need to divide it, that can be <laughs> a bit of work. Um, it's doable, but it, it can be a bit, of a, a bit of work to break it up if you're gonna divide it and share or divide it and move it around your landscape. Um, <clears throat> so that's the grass I grow. And then, the other is a rush and I bought it just cause it was so fun. Um, <coughs> so it's junk oh, if you uses the spiralis um, and it's corkscrew rush. And so this is a very wet example. Mine's in a pot that I keep fairly wet. Um, and it just has all these wonderful uh, Dr. Susian corkscrews to it that I just love. Um, and so I was warned that it can spread. I can't remember if it, it must've been be a rhizome, but it, that it can spread. 
So I do have it in a container pot and I just kind of periodically check to make sure it hasn't gone out of it. Um, but I really like it just because it adds a very cool visual texture. And right now mine is flowering. I don't have a picture of that, but I got a picture of it here. You can kind of see it on the right mm -hmm. um, from Dave's garden there. And it just is so, it just looks so cool because it, you know, we're so used to flowering plants, like being on the tips, you know, at the end of the stem or on a branch kind of where the buds are, but the, um, the flower is like two thirds of the way up, up each, um, rush stock, I guess for lack of a better way to put it. Um, and so it just, it just looks very, very fun. Like something out of, you know, Cindy Lou who would have in her garden. So, um, so that's, I, I, that's the rush I grow. that just is kind of adds some flavor to my garden space. Sweet. So that's it. <laughs> see no. it does very, like being very, wet very, the corkscrew rush does like being wet it wants to be wet so yeah a lot of them want their feet in the water for sure mm -hmm. a lot of sedges too very few grasses however though some of them like it really wet like that semaphore grass that that valerie mentioned <laughs> laurie how about you yeah, I, let me show a picture here. This is one that I just bought recently and um, I haven't planted yet. You will see this, so it's still in its little pot, but it's just a little feather grass. And I just, oh, I like nice. the way they blow in the wind. And I, the, the scientific name is Stipa tenuissima. Yes, Max, Mexican yes. feather, no. Yeah. Mexican feather grass, I think. It's really this pretty. Is, yeah. call it a yeah. This this one way is nice to have it where the wind is blowing it yeah. a bit. Yeah. And what I was just glancing at it and thinking about their little rhyme here, grasses with leaves all the way to the ground. Just looking at it, you see the little flowers and the senses that they're at the top. But I did manage mm -hmm. to cut one off, which is tricky. And sure enough, there are leaves not very many leaves, but there are a few down the stalk and to the ground. Yes. Grass. So I haven't planted it yet, but I, I just, I love grasses like everybody's saying, you know, in yeah. the wind. Uh, always really great. The, how tall is this one going to be? Did you? Um, it says height 24 inches. Yeah. Bloom, summer, fall. I think, I think that's one, the same one that I have, same species. And it spreads like crazy. It reseeds itself. Yeah, I've got another one, and I find little offspring frequently. Yeah. <laughs> but I think okay. But I, I don't know. I didn't try it in Pojar. I don't know what family it is. So the the genus is Stipa, I guess. Stipa or Stipa. Uh huh. Stipa. Stipa. So that's one that I bought, and I've got a a sedge in front that's just turned really into a nice plant, but I, I bought it and planted it before I knew there were differences between sedges and grasses. grasses and very so you fun. brought another grass-like plant, right? Right, yeah. Right. I noticed in Pojar they're together, so grasses, sedges, and rushes are all in the green section. That's right, yeah. There's some kind of relationship there, or maybe it's just visual, I don't know. Yeah. This is you, one you have a picture of the sedge you're going to show us too or um, no i don't i didn't take a picture oh, okay do you remember what its name was no i tend to save the tags though so i might have it somewhere okay well uh, always nice to know what's growing and what's doing well too yeah Ooh, okay well john has already told us that he has bamboo <laughs> So yeah, uh, tell us about John. Sure, I, I, I was going to try to get my picture of one bamboo, but I don't, a lot of you have probably seen it when you watched uh, one of the videos. That, but uh, I have a running bamboo, which is a monopodial uh, bamboo. That's the name of a running and grasses, grasses are called, that run are called monopodal. 
leptomorph rhizome systems, and then clumping. There's a bunch of clumping bamboo, which is good for a small lot, which is uh, called sympodial, pachomorph rhizome systems, I call it. And uh, I have a few uh, running ones here, which I planted next to my neighbor so he can enjoy them. <laughs> <laughs> but then I planted uh, the forest grass from Asia are all, all clumping. So some of them can get up to 20 feet tall, but most of them are around six feet tall. And I had one that I had, I planted at the place I worked in uh, 1998. And when I left there in 2015, it only had spread six feet in, in diameter, it spread. Hmm. And uh, so not all bamboos spread and they have their inflorescence the clumpers will uh, send flowers out maybe every 25 years. The running bamboo will send it out anywhere between 50 and 100 years before they'll send seeds out. Wow. Hmm. And it look, they look like little grains of uh, rice. And hmm. I've even propagated some of the, my clumpers by putting them in a baggie with uh, peat moss, damp peat. It takes them a hundred hundred years to get ready to sexually reproduce. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. I wonder why they bother. <laughs> why they bother? Uh, they have no fun in their life, do they? <laughs> I don't like that comment. <laughs> yeah, I gotta say it's so fascinating the diversity of um, growth habits. I mean, this is true of many plants, but particularly like with the grasses and bamboos and stuff, because like you said, John, you have stuff that like that one when you left your workplace that had barely, you know, expanded in all that time. And yes. then you have others that just go like crazy. Yes. And well, not, like it, the, the diversity in that growth habit is just so fascinating to me. <laughs> it is. And yeah. like, I, I know Katie knows this, but behind the Hoquiam Library, there used to be a row of bamboo between the wall of the hardware store next door and the paved parking lot. And the bamboo running, a running bamboo, ran under the asphalt and came up. <laughs> the asphalt. Yeah. Pretty, yes, they'll, pretty they'll do that. Yeah. Pretty determined. Uh, it has been destroyed since then. I believe an excavator was involved for part of that, I, I believe. Well, <laughs> That's no, not the only of... way you can get it out. Yeah. The well, Japanese it... have a saying that if you're in an earthquake, you run to the bamboo grove. <laughs> because those rhizomes are like a rebar and concrete yeah and it's stable they're really yeah. amazing things. it was kind of a yeah. one-two punch why they took them out at the library was because there was some concern about people um using them as weapons like breaking them off and using them for stuff and then also to the maintenance because the bo the bamboo would grow but then um like stuff would come off and land on cars and be in the um the right of way like if they bent over so it was kind of a multi-reason why they finally just took them out because just for management purposes <laughs> so now there's a very pretty flower garden there <laughs> yeah i had uh uh what the the main runners that you can grow in the northwest are uh oh my gosh final stashies and uh, they have two stems out of each no each node. So if you see a uh, bamboo with two stems coming out from each node, that's a runner. And mm. you probably don't want it if you're in a small city lot. But uh, the clumpers have multiple stems. Some of the Mexican, and there's a lot of American uh, bamboo. There's bamboo that's native to the East Coast of the United States. There's two species with several different uh, uh, cultivars and varieties of them mm -hmm. and then there's bamboo growing in Mexico and Central mm -hmm. America and South America and most of those are clumpers the one the ones from the east coast are runners so you don't want them though if you don't want to have to put a root bear around them and another thing bamboo and I, I've had this problem where I had this Henyan bamboo, which is a uh, Spilostachys uh, nigra Henyan, which is black bamboo, but 
this thing grew, grew 50 feet tall and had clumes uh, four inches in diameter. And it'd come up in asphalt and I'd cut it down or diquat or roundup into it, not diquat, roundup. I got my uh, diquat is a aquatic herbicide that we use, but anyway, roundup and it would kill the, the rhizomes coming back. But I found out that uh, from uh, Miles that we had on the, one of our meetings here, Dr. Miles, that Bamboo has the ability to block off their rhizomes if they feel they're under attack. Oh, wow. So it won't go in there and kill the whole grove. It just kills that one rhizome. Really? I've not mm -hmm. heard that. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's an you incredible survival it. technique. Isn't it? So what do they uh, do? Put up scar tissue or? or... I have no idea. That would be the most the logical to me would be some type yeah. of scar tissue formation or something that would block it off or, well, they have, yeah they have a like, membrane at each node so they might just there, somehow... there's that i mm. i bet that, that they solidified that in some real way like like leave incision layers for leaves that fall every fall mm. Mm -hmm. yeah probably something like that process and i bet it's controlled by an oxen <laughs> 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 you never know. Bell to, Bell to. I have learned so much since I've been in Grace Harbor. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is good, everybody. In, in Keep like, learning too. She, she just complimented us, so thank her. Yeah. Um, John, you grew the the really giant black bamboo, mm -hmm. but it's a runner. Yes. And you didn't try to contain it, at least well, not right away. Well, uh, the, the guy that was there many years before me planted it in 1975. Uh -huh. And then the hatchery crew had, uh, between the time he left and the time I arrived, had cut it all the way back to the bank of Issaquah Creek. So there was only a thin layer of it growing there. Uh -huh. And I, I like bamboo, so I let it come up to the... You know how you have uh, tables, they got the, a, a lower table where the creek floods mostly than mm -hmm. my upper lo the lawn area. And I kept it from going up into the lawn. But I fertilized the heck out of it and I got big. Like I said, 50 feet tall, four inch clumes. Once we had a snowstorm, an ice storm, and all this tall bamboo, it was about 20 feet from my house fell on top of my house and I thought oh, God, I got a mess to clean up but as soon as it thawed and then all the ice and snow melted it stood right back up amazing <laughs> I, I would love to grow some of that bamboo but but here's my worry going back to the back of the Hoquiam library bamboo patch when I first saw that it was going where it wasn't supposed to go I decided that I'd put in a barrier and I put concrete in the ground at one end of it, three feet deep and move wide. Mm -hmm. And it didn't stop it. How deep would you have to go for well, that? Well, three feet is probably pretty deep. good. But uh, if you had it at a ground level, the rhizomes might have snuck over the top of it. Mm. Yeah. They do. Yeah. They recommend that you put it three inches, three to four inches above the ground level. So, oh, interesting. Cut yeah, any rhizomes. Well, I think the lesson from this discussion on a particular kind of grass or grasses in general is you have to be careful what you decide to grow. <laughs> That's true. You know, there's a bunch of grasses that are on the weed boards watch list. Yes, there are. Mm -hmm. um, pre pretty invasive. Well, do you guys want to see one or two of my grasses? Sure. I have a lot of grass, but only a few kinds. Uh, Let's see if I can remember how to do this now. I'm going to share a screen. I'm going to go here. No. Um, uh, current slide. Can you see it? No. Uh, no. Nope. Can you see our pretty faces? <laughs> oh, geez. All right. I'm going <laughs> to guide me through this again. All right, I'm on the white screen. Yep. I'm going to the picture of it on my screen. Okay, and then click on it. Yep, yes. there we go. 
We see it. Yeah. Oh. You oh, see perfect. it. What does it look like? Because I'm not seeing it. Oh, we see a oh, blue it looks slide. Like zebra yeah. It's it's, it's it's zebra grass. That's on their watch list. Is it really? Mm -hmm. There you go. This has been here about four or five years. I'll have oh, to watch it. Grass. And, and um, yeah. Really, that one, Judith, was on that one, Washington's watch list. The, is I'll that one you're growing, like, or one that's just on your property? It's on the. It's at the fence line, way in the back, next to the alley. Oh, okay. I know where you're talking about. It's uh, but it has not been spreading at all. As in fact, it's been decreasing in Interesting. size. Yeah, I mean, it's the height is still the same of what comes up. But uh, the clump is not nearly as big as it once was. Anyway, this is, I, I find this any plant that it is supposed to be conducting photosynthesis with chlorophyll that's not green, I find intriguing. And that must have some advantage though, or it wouldn't be not green. And this thing, what's its advantage? I don't know. I've not been able to figure it out that it has. Uh, these stripes yeah, of non green. Pretty, it gets tall too. Doesn't it? it gets pretty tall, yeah. Anyway, it's it's been a pretty popular grass. It's one of the few grasses that I have that's not in a pot. Hmm. Is the advantage that it caught a horticulturalist eye and yes. kept growing that way? <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Let's keep this one. Let's keep propagating <laughs> that one. Um, this, right um, <laughs> there we go. All right. Now, the things in the front that are orange and kind of lavender color are not grasses. <laughs> um, they're, uh, is this in your garden, Jude? No, this is a picture of what's in my garden. Oh. Um, I don't have either of those plants, uh, those uh, dicots growing. No, they're, they're lilies. That looks like agapathus. It's, it does. The blue. And then this one here is uh, daylily. daylily. Yeah, don't have it. But it's <laughs> this grass here. Um, this is the same thing that uh, that Laurie has, right? A, a stippa. Gosh, that's beautiful. <clears throat> it is beautiful. Uh, tenuissima. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, you you grow this one just because it's very soft, mm -hmm. and it it flows more. I call it flowing more than waving, actually, because it's this kind of a slow motion in a light breeze. Very, very beautiful little thing. Um, another one that I have is, can you see that one? Yes, beautiful. Um, I'm probably going to forget the name of this one. This variety is called Carl Forster. And uh, it grows about four feet high for me. Um, and you can see this one isn't waving in the breeze. And again, this is not from my yard. Um, because I didn't have a good good picture of it, but it's also a very very nice one, and it's a clumper, and it has not spread much at all for me. And then let's see. Clara has Japanese forest grass, all gold, and Katie has Japanese forest grass, all gold, and I have Japanese forest grass, all gold. Mm -hmm. Some look green. The oh, that's because ones. they're not all gold. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Good observation, John. Oh, yeah, I see your uh, print down below. Narrow gean stripe? Um, a narrow uh, gene. That should be an R. <laughs> um, and Katie was talking about one that's variegated. The stripes go lengthwise on the, sure. on the leaf, not crosswise like they do on the zebra grass. But um, the Japanese forest grass you can see in this picture is not quite as yellow as the pictures that Katie showed you. And it's because it's, it's not getting the uh, proper amount of sunlight for it to be gold. Um, wow. I have one that is green and I have one that has a red stem that's green and then the striped one. So I have at last count, I think I have um, I have a, more than a dozen pots, big pots of forest grass. Holy cow! And um, 
<laughs> you have to divide it, John. I think I invited you to come and divide for me one day. Well, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, but it wasn't the uh, grand. It was that. Uh, oh, is that? Oh, yeah, the heron, the night. Yeah, heron. the heron. Uh, anyway, these are, these are beautiful things, and I like to move plants the way some people like to move furniture. <laughs> but uh, I did get a, a message from Midge Hunnicutt, uh, one of Clara's classmates from last training class, saying that she really loved forest grass, but and she used to grow it when she lived in West Seattle, uh, but she hasn't been able to grow it in Westport, that it just doesn't do well. Really? Huh. Yeah, I don't know why it doesn't do well, but um, anyway, I wrote back to her and I says, well, do what I do and grow it in a pot with, with good potting soil. Yeah. But these are, they're, they're wonderful grasses. And- Did, did so, you get any results back from her? I haven't, but I, frankly, I haven't been on my, on my uh, email. Oh. Well, not in the last hour or so. Anyway, <laughs> well, listen, it's um, thank you all for showing the pictures. Um, I was going to show you a PowerPoint that Cindy did for us uh, a few years ago. And um, it's all about the taxon, how, how the flower of grasses is, is developed and so on. It would be really good. But she was put on jury duty and had to beg off. And so that's why you're not seeing seeing that. Well, but there there was one one fic picture from it that I really liked. Mm -hmm. wow. um, and this is just one floret. I, I could have shown that to wow. you earlier, but I didn't know if it had time. I wanted to show you because of this on, uh, which we had in the key. And you can see there some of them are not this long compared to the rest of the floret. But um, this one's really, really an intricate, and I don't know what the grass is, have no idea. But I wanted you to see these anthers, um, stigma. Stigma. These are the female part. Mm -hmm. The stigma is the sticky part, the part that catches the pollen. Mm. And these anthers that are, are golden. Um, I'm going to go forward. Oh, oh. There's another one. Does this oh, wow. plant look like anything that you've seen before? Yeah. What does it look like? We looked at this. Glory is Poa annuus. Poa annua. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted you to see a close up of it. It's usually fairly easy to see the anthers on grass flowers because they do hang out. The stigma is, is sometimes more difficult to see, but that one's really pretty. Now I'm going to show you. Here's uh, another kind showing can you see the stigma in this inflorescence at all there are kind of peeking out in the middle yeah there's some right here they mm -hmm. almost look like a little tuft of cotton mm -hmm. or anything or, or fungal yeah. filaments yeah now you know grasses at least all of them that i know of are pollinated by wind mainly mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. Well, Ooh, wow. is this gorgeous? Yes. This is called, <laughs> I forgot what it's called, something like red kangaroo grass. Oh, anyway, it's from Australia. Oh my gosh. It really, it really is that color. And, mm. um, and you can, I guess you could get them from a specialty nur nursery. But I, I was don't really- I think they're hardy here, Jude. It may, maybe not, it, maybe it's too cold here. But you can grow them in a pot, and bring them indoors. Grow them in a pot and bring them in. Uh, here's a, a, a another close up of it. Wow. But with these long ons on it. I'll look up the name for you if you really want to see it. But I wanted to show you these. Beautiful. And these are lavender, kind of. Wow. Mm. Oh, that's, it's just the recording's just going to be my voice coming out being like, oh, that's so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs>
over and over yeah, again. Like, okay, I mean, people will be this. able to see what I'm saying oh. that to, but okay. honestly, these are all just so gorgeous. They are gorgeous. Yeah. And this one is orange anthers and purple stigma mm. looking like a bottle brush sticking out. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. Now, and, it's, and uh, it's just amazing because most people miss this because a lot of times when these, when the, the reproductive window has, you know, opened, <laughs> it sometimes happens so fast that if you don't mm -hmm. know what to look for, you don't even see any of this stuff. Right. And, you know, I think it's just true about grasses. Uh, I think most Americans tolerate them. I mean, we walk on them, we mow them. We mow them way too often, <laughs> way too short, but we don't really pay very much attention to them. And that's the truth. But if you look really closely, like one day sometime this spring in the garden, we were looking at the grasses that had been grown as overwintering cover crops. Mm -hmm. And they were beautiful. Val, you were there that day, weren't you? Mm -hmm. When we were looking at the oats and how yeah. the anthers were hanging out, yeah. just gorgeous. Now, I said something a while ago about wind pollination. Why do you think these are so colorful if they're wind pollinated? Ooh, that's a good point. Yeah. They aren't wind pollinated. They are wind pollinated. They are. It, do, it doesn't match with most most of nature that the color attracts something. Hmm. Well, some of them maybe maybe they are uh, are pollinated by an insect, or maybe even by a, a bird. But to po be pollinated by an insect, the insect's got to be there for something to reward it. Mm -hmm. That could be the pollen. It's probably um, not any nectar because the grasses tend not to do that. But mm -hmm. I, it's just fascinating yeah. why, why the color why the color is there. I anyway, wanted to share, share that with you. That's why plants are so fascinating. Kind of things like that. Aren't they? Mm -hmm. They're totally, totally fascinating. And they're so different from, from us. Could it be like some ancient like holdover? Like since it it since it doesn't feel any reproductive pressures because it's wind pollinated like maybe that's why those colors are still there like it didn't need to change them for anything i don't know if that line of thought makes sense but mm -hmm. you know just like it, so it could just be that color even though it ended up going maybe a different way for its reproductive processes right it could. maybe maybe that's uh, certainly certainly a possibility you know, I kind of thought about all of the colorful fishes that are on, on the coral reefs. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's real easy to come up with some reasons or functions that those mm -hmm. colors play for the fish. It's a way for them to, to find each other for one thing, recognize each other as a possible mate for breeding. But with these wind pollinated plants, it's just yeah. one of those things I'm likely not to ever find out right <laughs> would like to know you know do you know if they came before flowering plants no 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 they didn't they are they are flowering plants so you want to ask the question differently oh okay did they come before gymnosperms gymnosperms yeah so the grasses and and um all of the plants that we usually have petunias and roses and and oak trees and so on are are seed plants yes their seeds are made in a protective covering uh, over uh, seeds, um, mm -hmm. pine cones. But before them, there were some things that were even less, less uh, advanced. And, uh, but grasses came way after conifers. Okay. Maybe they were jealous of all the other flowering plants. So wanted to put on their nice, <laughs> nice outerwear. I love that. I think that's the reason why. <laughs> oh, we love me. This uh, actually, they knew that we were going to be around, and they did this for us. Yeah. So we would take them home with us and spread them around the world. There you go. <laughs> well, why not? <laughs> well, why not? Uh, Some logic to that, you know. Yeah. Now there are a couple of business kinds of items that we need to do. Um, do you, Do you want me to stop recording then? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Bye. See you next time.